So, uh, Chris, thank you very much for joining uh, Mr. Whalen and I. Um, thank you for being flexible um, in joining us in this e-learning instructional mode. Um, I'd like to start off by asking you to introduce yourself and then to tell us um, when somebody asks you what you do for a living, how do you respond? Awesome. Well, thanks for having me, guys. So, yeah, so my name is Chris Falcon. Um, I am an entrepreneur, uh, and I also call myself a natural-born creative. Uh, when people ask me what I do for a living, um, I usually kind of pause because uh, sometimes it's hard for me to answer that question. Um, you know, but I usually end up telling them that there are a lot of different ways that I make money. Um, and the, 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 the business or the um, profession that makes me the most money would be my fitness business. Uh, but I also make money doing motivational speaking. Um, I also have a media company that also brings in money. Um, I sell children's books that bring me in a little bit of money every month. I sell artwork that brings me in some money. Um, but I kind of break it down based on you know, all the different things I have going on and the hierarchy of what makes me the most money to the least amount of money. <laughs> and, 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 and after about the seventh thing, they typically either lose interest or start shaking their heads and they're like, how do you have the time to do all that? Which leads to another really interesting conversation. So th those are all things that I think we'll want to dive into. Um, but I was wondering if we could talk um, a little bit more about the fitness business, since you sort of put that as as the business that brings in the most money, um, that that's the one that you start off with. Could you explain yep. what is the nature of that business, and maybe how sure. did you get started in it, and sort of where is it going at this point? Yeah, sure, no problem. Um, so I'll start by saying that um, that I opened a one-on-one -on -one personal training facility about 13 years ago. I grew up in an exercise motivated family. My uncle has never worked for anyone else other than himself. And he opened a gym when he was 17, 18 years old and also started a construction business. So I grew up around a lot of entrepreneurship and I grew up inside his gym. Uh, so 13 years ago, I decided to do that on my own. Um, I still have a personal training uh, facility today. It's not uh, the same size as it was 13 years ago. It's much larger and we've recently expanded into uh, group fitness as well So we moved from one-on-one -on -one to also having classes like spinning yoga uh, bar all those different things and um, And the industry's been fantastic. Um, I've been passionate about fitness my entire life um, I had I grew up with no formal business education um, I don't even have, uh, I didn't even finish college. I still have another semester to go there. Uh, but what I really had going for me was an incredible amount of passion um, and, and usually way more energy than most other people had. So I took all that and uh, I just went for it. And now I'm here today. That's really cool. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what that decision process was like for you when you went from, um, maybe perhaps working for your uncle or working for somebody to working for yourself. What were the, the risks that you assessed? What was going through your mind at that point? And um, maybe what advice would you give to somebody who's in a similar situation where they're doing something where they think they might be able to go off on their own, but they're not quite sure? Well, this is what I'll tell you. I'll tell you that I, um, I, I tell people this all the time, but I mean, I was afforded with this, I have nothing to lose mentality at the time when I decided to go into entrepreneurship. Um, I, you know, around 9 11 is when I, I kind of stopped going to college. I got really distracted. I just couldn't focus on, you know, being in a philosophy class, which I was a philosophy major, when there was just so much kind of turmoil in the world. And so I said, I'm going to take a break. Um, I had already been training people a little bit on the side because I had to pay my own way through school. And, uh, and ultimately, I just turned into, you know what, let me just continue going this way while I figure out what I want to do. And if things don't work out, screw it. I've got nothing to lose. It's not like I wasted a degree. Um, it's not like I, you know, took my parents' money and, and blew it. Um, I kind of put all my risk um, and all my energy on the line. And I was like, if, if, if it doesn't work, um, the only person I have let down is myself. Um, and so I just decided to go for it. And, um, and, and that decision was scary. But at the same time, when you're young, I was 23, 24 years old, um, <laughs> you know, you can afford to take risks, you know. And so I took advantage of my youth, my energy, my passion. And at the time, it felt really right. 
um, you know, what, what advice would I give somebody else? Um, I, I, I went into that with no business plan, with no working capital, um, with nothing. And luckily, it, 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 things worked out okay for me. But I would definitely not do that again the same way. Um, I would tell somebody if they're going to go ahead and do something like that. There definitely are. Um, there's the right way to do it and the wrong way to do it. Um, you know, and so I would definitely tell them not to do it that way. But if you are young and you're motivated and you're passionate, I think that, you know, I'm the person that's going to tell you to take some risk, but try to make it as calculated as possible. I'm wondering if you could talk about some of the lessons that you learned in doing it the wrong way. If any comes to mind. <laughs> oh, man. Um, in doing it the wrong way. I learned so many lessons, um, lessons that ultimately... Um, took me to uh, to losing a company because I, I started my first one. Um, let's see, which would have been I opened my first gym in two thousand and four, um, two thousand and four, and then I opened a second facility in two thousand eight, two thousand and nine, two thousand and nine. Which you guys know what happened in two thousand and nine. Um, so I took that same mentality of oh I don't need a business plan and oh I don't need to be that um, prepared. And I took that into opening a second location, and then that failed, and I lost, um, you know, many, many tens of thousands of dollars. So, um, so if I had to give um, just a few big examples, because you know I can get into the really little ones, but one thing that didn't really work well for me at that very young age was I did not do a good job listening to people um, that had more experience than than I had. I felt like the passion and the energy I had was enough to blast through any obstacle and and that really was not true there were uh, people that were more experienced than me around me people that were ready and willing to lend advice and I was it wasn't that I was stubborn but I would listen to them take it in and be like okay but I'm gonna do it my way anyway um, maybe that's the way I needed to learn and my youngest son learns that way he has to make the mistake in order for it to really stick um, but I think that I would, if I had to give somebody a, a really big, big tip, I would say right now at this point in time, there are so many examples of the right way to do it. There's so much information out there. Utilize it, take advantage of it, do your research, and trust me, like if you want to go ahead and to, you know, you have to apply 10,000 hours of your time to, to be an expert on something, you can, in essence, shorten that by learning from the experiences of other people, and you have more access to those experiences than ever before. So you're involved with the Glenview Chamber of Commerce, is that correct? Yeah, I'm the president of the Glenview Chamber of Commerce. We represent about 600 businesses. So um, can you talk about that experience and how that ties into the idea of maybe finding mentorship or finding somebody who has been there before you who could offer you some advice to you know, shorten that 10,000 hour window? Yeah, um, so I have all types of weird systems to ba to balance um, all the things that I'm into. And when people say, how do you have time for that? Um, it's not with just reckless abandon. I, I, I follow a system that I like to call the playground system. And within that playground are a bunch of different sandboxes. So all of the different things that I do make up a single sandbox. So the Glenview Chamber of Commerce is one. Um, my fitness business is one. My books are another. And there's a whole bunch of, uh, of sandboxes on in my playground. Um, what there's many things that can link those sandboxes together to create a system system of connections that can allow for for growth and opportunity. Um, and one of those connection points would be uh, the the people that you're connected to. Uh, and I steal Les Brown's. Um, you know, terminology of OQP, only quality people. And so I will uh, analyze that sandbox, uh, figure out what type of individuals uh, would help uh, the success of that sandbox, um, figure out how those quality people uh, link to other sandboxes that I have, and create a system of connections that allow me to thrive and create growth opportunity. Uh, the Glenview Chamber of Commerce and working my way up to president of that organization was simply an opportunity for me to handle my philanthropic um, you know, desires of giving back to the community and creating opportunity for other businesses, but also an opportunity to connect with quality people uh, within the business community where I can not only assist them, uh, but also have them uh, hook up with any of the different sandboxes that I have going on. I'm wondering so if you I, could take one step back and could you explain to our students exactly what role the Glenview Chamber of Commerce serves and maybe what 
any Chamber of Commerce serves? Yeah, so the Chamber of Commerce um, typically is kind of like the voice, um, basically advocates for, for business in the community. Um, and so different chambers um, might have, you know, a culture that is unique to them and that some might do more advocating um, as far as policy and legislation is concerned. So making sure that, you know, that laws that are passed can be beneficial uh, for the businesses. And some just play more of a role of connecting business people together and connecting the community members with businesses. But in short, the Chamber of Commerce is going to be a collective group of businesses um, and they're connecting with each other, networking with each other, and making sure that you keep the local business community thriving, strong, um, you know, interconnected. So that's really the point of the Chamber of Commerce. Great. So I think it's important for students to realize that there are systems in place that you can tap into. Um, it, I know Chicago has a vibrant startup um, ecosystem uh, with 1871. <laughs> And so it's important for people to, to seek those out and find them, um, you know, wherever they are, because they exist. They, they totally exist. And, and one tip I would give, you know, when it comes to, um, to seeking out those opportunities um, and, and getting the most out of it, I, I firmly believe if you're going to get involved in any organization or, or uh, you know, any, anything that allows you to start networking, try to find a way to play a leadership role in that organization. If it's just a simple networking group, find out how to be the person that helps to organize um, and put it together. If you're gonna be a part of a chamber, don't just be a member, not that there's anything wrong with that, um, but you know, maybe try to join uh, one of the special interest groups or become an ambassador or on the board of, you know, of directors. Uh, there's no better way to put a spotlight on your company or whatever it is you're doing or even just to network than becoming a, uh, playing a leadership role in the community or in an organization, I feel like. I think that's great advice. Um, so in, in a moment, Brian's gonna fill you in a little bit about what we're doing in our class. Um, but I think this next question I'm gonna ask relates to that. Can you talk about some of the other things that you are doing? You talked about you have a media company, you're, you've uh, written children's books. I know you had an invention last time that you were um, in class. Can you talk just a little bit about sort of the variety of other things that, that you have going on, the other irons in the fire, so to speak? Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. So when, when I was a, a little kid, and like most kids, um, if you would have asked me, like, you know, what I thought I wanted to be or do when I grew up, I would have told you everything in the world. I'm not only going to be a football player, I'm going to be an astronaut and a firefighter. Sky was the limit for me. Um, and so most kids believe that. And then sometimes as you get older, reality and maybe people in the world kind of beat some of that out of you um, and take kind of that dream or the ability to dream out and, and that kind of stinks when that happens. So, um, so growing up and, 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 you know, suffering from depression and a few things, you know, it was really important for me to kind of get that mentality back. The mentality that, you know what, I actually can do anything that I want to do. Um, and it wasn't so much like, can I maximize each and every one of those things? When a kid tells you they want to be an astronaut, a football player, and a baseball player, it doesn't, it's in their mind, they don't actually think about it all the work that goes into and the success of being a real major league baseball player, what they're doing is they're dreaming. Those portals are open, all that's open. And so I, I live my life completely open in that way. Um, and so that allows me the energy and the drive to really attack any um, of the passions that I have, which includes writing children's books, songs, inventing products. And, and I, I'm foolish enough to push all of them as far as I can. And if it doesn't, sell a million, you know, pieces or whatever, then that's fine. I still did it. And so, yeah, so, um, so I've got fitness. I got a media company where we record podcasts and different types of multimedia for businesses. That's doing great. I actually have my own podcast as well, which is awesome. I've connected with really amazing people that I never thought I would just because of having this on my own podcast. Um, I've invented some products and some things like that. I've got this awesome thing, the Ergo Pick. Uh, which is again, we've talked about that before. Um, but man, is that that we're like a week away from launching the website and uh, and selling these things direct to consumer, uh, which is really cool. And so, can you explain what the Ergo Pick is to the students who haven't seen it before? Yeah, so the Ergo Pick is awesome. Um, I, probably, I could probably I could grab one. I've got some over there. Um, okay. But the ergo pick, basically one day when I was sitting down um, and I was writing some lyrics and then I started to kind of construct some melodies, um, I had a pick in my hand and I was playing the guitar Then I put the pick down and I grabbed the pen and I was writing the lyrics. And then eventually I was kind of air guitaring uh, the melody with the pen in my hand and then writing some lyrics down. And then, you know, 
the idea came to me. It's like, man, wouldn't it be nice if I could just have a pen and a pick in one implement? So I went downstairs and I got some super glue and I hacked it all together and I turned my pen into a pick so that I could just flip it back and forth and play and write, play and write. And so that concept turned into um, you know a whole bunch of patents that I now have on it, um, a whole bunch of um, prototypes. And now we've got a go-to-market you know product that's amazing. I love it. And uh, you can play guitar, write lyrics, and it's a stylus all in one implement. Super cool. Very cool. I think um, one of the lessons that we try to teach in the class of business incubators, don't let better be the enemy of good. And so I love that you didn't, you know, wait to make a, a 3D, you know, CAD model and then send it out to have it professionally 3D printed. You went and grabbed super glue and took an existing pick and an existing pen and put it together and said, hey, this really works. Now I can do the next better version of this a lot quicker. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I had Sean Riley, one of the co-founders of, uh, of Dude Wipes, on my uh, on my podcast a couple weeks ago, and you know, and he just said something that was just like was just really simple. He goes, "I didn't need to have the best product in the world. I just needed to have a good one, um, and then you can always improve upon it." And we so that's the, what he did, uh, and yeah, and he's improved upon it. We had one of the co-founders of Dude Wipes, Jeff Klimkowski, in our class. Oh yeah, it's years years ago. Oh, awesome, yeah. awesome, yeah, super cool guys. So I think this would be probably a good time, Brian, for you to jump in and sort of bring up some of the questions that you had. Yeah, Chris, again, thanks. Um, I think your your story is is awesome, and I, I hope as students are listening to this, I think they uh, they can get all, a lot out of it, and I, I'm, I'm confident that something uh, is going to resonate with them. And so as Mike shared with you before we started recording, uh, we're taking a little bit of a I guess in the entrepreneurial spirit, a little bit of a pivot with our curriculum going forward, um, and pausing the uh, the team setup and the the team model of instruction for our class, and um, we're helping students work on a side hustle project. And so, uh, very early on, since we're only really in the first week of this, uh, we've we've shared some students uh, some resources, um, some podcasts, and some articles to get them thinking about what exactly. Um, a side hustle is. Uh, and so I kind of want to do two things with you. One um, is if you could maybe go back and what was you, what was your first uh, that you identified as, okay, this is kind of something in addition to my main uh, source of income. And then from there, get into some advice specifically related to things that these students are going to be doing outside of their ordinary day. So again, first, if you could go back and if you could maybe think about what was the first uh, um, side hustle uh, that you got started on. Yeah, I think the first side hustle um, that I got started on, uh, I guess, was probably the um, was probably the children's stories. Maybe um, that was probably the first one. And um, I, I've always loved writing. I have a very vivid imagination. Um, I've actually written um, over 20 children's stories, maybe over 30 now at this point, but I've only published two of them. Um, and so that was the first thing that I did. And um, it was really just about just taking something that I was really passionate about and just 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 going with it. Um, you know, I, I researched what it would be like to, to self-publish. Again, there are so many opportunities for people now to express their creative side and, and just get out there and make things happen. And so that was the first thing I did. And it, it felt great. It was very empowering for me to recognize that I was not held captive to, let's, let's just call it my, my nine to five, which I didn't really feel that way. I mean, I had my own business at that time. So, I mean, I felt free, um, but like it's very easy to just walk around and just say, I'm a personal trainer. Um, and that's just who I am and what I am. Well, at that point, after I published my first one and, and it actually made it to on, on, on Amazon, it was like I uh, made the list of top ten best-selling children's stories in the first couple weeks. Very cool. Um, right now, I was no longer just a personal trainer; I was a mm -hmm. personal trainer and a children's book author. And so that felt so good to be kind of free of just that single label. And now I was like, well, okay, so now I'm these two things. What else can I be? Mm -hmm. um, and so it was just continuing to grow. And after a while of adding all these different ventures what are you then? Are you just a personal trainer or are you something else? And so, you know, that's why it's always so interesting when people ask you, what do you do or what are you? It's like, man, I'm a creative. I make things happen, blah, 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 blah. It's hard to just say it because I don't even identify as one thing anymore. You know, I think too with, uh, 
what side hustles and some of the things that we've shared with our students early on is uh, everybody's going to uh, get into their side hustle for different reasons. Um, some of it, some of them might be that it is something that they're truly passionate about. Um, it might be uh, a communication mode, as as you explained. Um, maybe they want to learn something and they're turning. So I I think what I love about this is that um, it's not necessarily that. Uh, it's not necessarily about the income. Could the income come as a result of it? Yes. Did you, when you first started your children's book, did you go into it saying that I wanted to create a secondary or another source of income? Um, I mean, I think everybody hopes that maybe that could, ha you know, that could happen, but that was not my motivation at that time. Um, it, it, at that moment in time, and I love that you say that there's so many different reasons why somebody might want to take on a side hustle and certainly, you know, bringing in some more uh, money, another source of income is important and can be a motivating factor. But for me, it was becoming a certain type of person. Um, that's way more important to me. Um, so rather than be, than actually becoming successful, um, cause there's a lot of different ways that someone might stumble upon some success, perhaps, um, I wanted to be, become the type of person um, that could be successful. Uh, and I, in my mind, I had a really interesting view of, of what that meant for myself personally. And that was to become the type of person that, um, that would execute, that would make things happen. Um, and there's so many little things that you have to do, you know, when, when, when publishing a children's story, for instance, um, I mean, <laughs> where, where are you going to get the illustrations? How are you going to format the book? You got to write it. There's so, there's so many things. And so it was the process of getting it done that forged me into something that I wasn't before. And that's what's really important to me. Did I actually get forged into something new? And after all the companies I've started, after all the patent processes and trademarks and the business meetings and chambers and all these things, I'm a very specific person right now with a very specific set of experiences. And so it's going to allow for really interesting opportunities to come my way because I painted a very particular picture. Um, and, and the world is starting to notice that. I think that's kind of fun too. That's awesome. Um, so as we shared, we're pretty early in this process. Um, you know, just a couple days of, of some resources and um, we've been sharing with students uh, a, a podcast called um, Side Hustle School. Uh, Chris Gillibo, who's the author of The $100 Startup, you're probably familiar with. Um, mm -hmm. And so, uh, Right now, with most of these students probably being or having their first exposure to this idea of a side hustle, uh, what kind of overarching uh, advice or tips can you provide? Obviously, as they get into their side hustles, it'll get a little bit more specific. Um, but just as a high school student who has this opportunity uh, to pursue a side hustle, what can you what can you say to them? Well, I probably um, I probably want to share with them something that um, a system that I utilize um, for every single project that I work on, which is something I call the concentric influence approach. And so, the concentric influence approach um, is made up of, of a few different concentric rings, and and the first one is comprised of the ring that I call you. And so, in focusing on you, I tell you to to, to look at yourself, um, figure out you know. What are some things that, that, that you're personally interested in or you're passionate about or you're curious about um, that you will identify with and align with? And so if I had somebody sitting down right in front of me, I'd tell you, take out a piece of paper and tell me eight uniques. These uniques, and don't think about anyone else in the world. Just tell me eight things that you're either passionate about, you're interested in, and you want to do. And in the world of side hustle, you'd want to think in that framework. Um, don't tell me about your regular job. Tell me about eight other things that you might be interested in. And if you want a side hustle and you're not even sure what that might be, then let's really kind of define the you also. Let, then let's figure out what you're about and then maybe we can figure out a side hustle. But always starting with you um, and, and, and your, your place um, is, is, is number one. Um, and then the next uh, ring outside of that would be connecting with uh, quality people people that you can um, that you can share what it is that you're interested with and those people that might be able to connect you with other opportunities. And so that's something that I always do. If I decide that my side hustle is going to be, um, you know, making beer, I'm then going to look at my circle of influence um, and start to figure out, okay, who can I talk to that might be a quality person that might know something or be able to be somewhat of a, of a positive influence in the world of make, starting a craft brewery 
um, or marketing or something like that. So connect with those people. Um, and then that system kind of moves on from there. You then want to be able um, to connect with a slightly uh, larger, um, so all those people that like those connections connect you to kind of makes that next ring, which I call, and, and I kind of differentiate those between internal connections and external connections. So it's you, your internal connections, external connections, um, and then the masses ultimately. And once you get to that point of the, of the concentric influence approach, that's when you're kind of influencing um, and marketing uh, to the world and, and, and really framing how the world looks at you and what it is that you're doing. Um, so a simple example of that would be, okay, I'm going to go ahead and do craft brewery. Um, I've, I've identified that that's what I'm passionate about. I know exactly why I'm doing it. Um, I'm then going to connect with some people that I know that can help me. They're going to connect me with some external contacts. And then I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to start to, um, you know, maybe uh, speak with you guys, you know what I mean? And start talking about it or, or, or get on a podcast um, and, and start talking about, you know, these things that I'm interested in, finding other big kind of external opportunities so that now if someone listens to that podcast, they're going to think of Chris Falcon and this brewery in a certain way. So you can start to influence how the masses and how the world see you. And all that stuff starts to create this framework of you as this um, micro brewer. Um, and so that's kind of how the system works. And you just kind of keep, you know, expanding out, then coming back to the you because you're always learning, then expanding out and connecting again and coming back to you and it just kind of keeps you know going in and out like that um and just creating opportunities for growth i love uh, how you're sort of tying that back into what you said earlier about uh, making connections you know those concentric circles exist or at least they're stronger connections you know when you have a role of leadership when you're getting involved with ecosystems that already exist anything that you're interested in pursuing seems to be easier to pursue um, when those connections are made. So I'm, I'm finding that that is an interesting thing that you just brought up. You know what, it's, it's it, yeah, I mean, everything you just said is true. And, and that's part of the reason why, if, if you're gonna go ahead and you're gonna start a side hustle, okay, a side hustle to your main hustle, or maybe you're gonna have multiple side hustles, what's gonna allow you to organize your hustle um, and make it um, way more manageable is connecting with the right people, connecting with you know the right entities, all these things make the lifting a lot lighter. And so that's something that I do. I don't have any um, uh, you know, projects that I'm working on where it's just me sitting by myself in a room. Uh, the very first thing I do is I think about that concentric influence approach and start connecting all these dots. And even if you look at like my podcast, my podcast would be an example of the final ring, like the masses um, where I take this entity now that I've created in that podcast. And like, I mean, I had people reaching out to me from really at this point it's kind of been all over the world um that, that listen to this podcast and now they have a particular view on who i am and what i'm about and so that's me influencing what the world sees and what they believe this brand of chris falcon the rebel mindset and whatever is about and so and that can happen with writing for the paper which i've done um even publishing children's books can be something that that's kind of a mass uh, you know shape changer um, you know, the public speaking that I do, you know, can work in that way. So finding those opportunities are really cool. It also strikes me that your side hustles specifically cross pollinate in ways that at first glance, you wouldn't necessarily think that they would. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, and that's to pursue further side. For sure. You were so for involved. sure. Yeah. Yeah. And that's like the whole system of connections. Right. So there's a million things that you can do. And I, and I have a lot. Um, but if I looked at it like, okay, I've got all these burners right in front of me and you know, I want to put things on the back burner and the front burner, the things that I kind of pull to the front are things where like I can see obvious connections. And sometimes even if the projects don't look like, wait a minute, like how could you connect A with B? But the people that are actually, it's not the projects that are connecting sometimes, it's the people that I've connected with to support that project that I can link together for things. And so, you know, I think when you look at that playground, um, that way and how it is you can create that system of connections between your sandboxes, um, that's when things get really powerful. When your gym can, can, can subsidize your podcast, your podcast can sell your pick. When your pick creates opportunities for you to publish your lyrics and your music, and then your music creates more opportunities for guests on your show, and then guests on the show create opportunities for you to get investors for something else. And once you get this system going, it can have a whole energy and a whole heartbeat of its own. 
That's very cool. Uh, we're trying to keep these interviews for our students in the 20 to 30 minute range. So we're, we're coming up to that time frame just about now. Um, so cool. I, I have one final question. And Brian, if you have anything else to add, you can. And if, Chris, if you have anything else you want to add, by all means. Um, if you had like, any final words of wisdom or advice for young people that are looking to um, do something entrepreneurial, start their own side hustle, is there anything that you would say that we haven't talked about yet? Um, well, I, you know, I don't want to be, I'm not a negative person at all, but I'd want to say this, the, the world isn't always on your side. Um, you know, I, I feel like that you just have to be real with that. And, and with this whole situation that we have right now with COVID and everything, um, you know, I was talking to my executive director for the chamber and, she, and I needed to kind of address all of our members. And she said, what time as a business owner. And for me, I always want to hear the truth first. Tell me the truth. Don't sugarcoat it. Because if I know the truth, that means that I can make decision, you know, the right decisions. If you're if you're sugarcoating it and I don't get the truth, then from the very get-go, my decisions are faulty. Mm -hmm. And so the truth is when it comes to entrepreneurship, is that there's going to be a lot of resistance. The world isn't always on your side. Even from the very get-go, you could conceive of an idea and tell your parents or your friends, and they might tell you that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Um, you know, the, the guys behind Dude Wipes will be the first ones to tell you all about that. Like, you want to start to do what? <laughs> you know? Um, and so there's going to be resistance. You need to understand and decide um, whether you're in or not and what you're in for and what, if you are going to be in what you're willing to give. Um, because there's definitely there's always going to be an exchange of energy. If you want to receive something, you've got to decide what you're willing to give for it. Thank you. Brian, do you have anything final to add? No, I'm good. Chris, again, I, like I said before, uh, we love your message. Um, and I hope that uh, students take advantage of it because, um, you know, I think you talk about taking advantage of opportunities. This, the current environment right now is certainly a unique opportunity. Um, and it would be a shame if uh, we go past this time, however long uh, we're in this frame of or this form of learning for, uh, and not look back on it and say that uh, you know that, that you didn't get something out of it, or at the end you didn't have something to show uh, for all the time spent. Yeah, yeah, I, I I agree. You know, it is crazy times, but you know, I think that you know myself as an entrepreneur, I I look at this and I'm I'm kind of comfortable in in this space and in this environment. Because, um, you know, and I think of one of my mentors, this will be kind of the final thing I'll say, but one of my mentors is my uncle, um, really successful businessman. He owns maybe about 15 or 16 different car dealerships right now. And back in 2009, we had a big financial crisis. Um, you know, if you were a car dealer, there were a lot of issues. And so a lot of his peers were losing their dealer. Many people just had serious depression. And a lot of his peers were people that um, inherited the dealerships or inherited the money. Um, my uncle was a you know poor kid from Cuba who came here with nothing who built it all by himself And so the struggle he, he was used to the struggle. He was used to the fight, you know So I never got comfortable. I've never been comfortable and so to be in this situation right now as an entrepreneur Like this is where I'm comfortable man. Like oh, we got an awesome fight now Like this is this is it. This is why this is what it's all about You know, you don't lose your company. You stop fighting for your company. You don't lose your idea You stop fighting for your idea. You don't lose you know, your freedom or anything, you stop fighting for it. And so I tell you guys, you know, young guys, if you guys want, young gals, if you want to do this, you want to get something going, recognize that you're going to have to fight for it, whether it's a good environment, bad environment, good economy, bad economy, doesn't matter. That fight is constant and, and, and you just got to keep. I feel great right now. I'm ready to fight. <laughs> All right, Chris. Well, thank you so much for joining us. And yeah. I think we'll, we'll wrap things up here. Awesome. Thanks, Hope guys. Hope to see you in person soon. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. <laughs> I know, right? We shake hands. <laughs> yeah, air high five. <laughs> thank you, guys. All right, there it is. Got a little elbow.